All right, guys. So as you know, here at Killer Cuisine, we believe in serving up nourishment, not just for the body, but for the mind and the soul as well. And today's nourishment is being served up by a Chicago-based artist, John Ross Wilson. John, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, brother. I really appreciate it. I've been looking forward to this. So John, I've got a good cocktail here and a couple of questions. Let's dive into this and get this baby done. So John, what did your start in art look like? And what was the beginning like for you? Well, I mean, I, I started as a, as, as really as a baby. I mean, my mom told me that the first time she knew I was going to be an artist is they, they left me in this, in my crib and uh, I uh, got into my diaper <laughs> um, on the wall there. So ever since a, as a, even as a small child, I, I've uh, wanted to be an artist. And, Who are some of your biggest influences in the art world? You know, right now, um, my biggest influences are actually other artists that I know, like um, local artists. I mean, obviously, there's artists that, you know, I, you'd see in a museum and whatnot. Um, but that was a great thing about living here in Chicago is I started to um, get to know a lot of amazing artists in town. It started out with my relationship with this abstract painter named Wesley Kimmler, um, who does these huge, huge, large abstract paintings. And he was like the first um, painter that I was really inspired by. And since then, there's been um, several local artists in town. There's this man named Slang, who's like this graffiti artist and painter and does these incredible murals around town. He's like, you know, he's my definitely my favorite artist um, in Chicago right now. And I, I always tell him, I'm like, Slang, you're, you're always my, like my favorite artist um, in the world. And he'd always say, the world? Why can't it be the Milky Way, John? You know, and um, there's other artists that uh, I really love. There's this a woman named Megan Kind. I love her art. My friend Lico Vision. Um, this is my friend. I have a friend named Zach who's doing some really great work in town. So, so much local stuff here, and those are right now kind of becoming my favorite artists. So let me ask this to somebody who's not real familiar with the inside of the art community and just on the outside as an admirer and a buyer. Um, what is the competition level like in a city the size of Chicago? Are you guys more interested in helping each other or is it more of a cutthroat kind of business? We really do support one another and we're always trying to find each other gigs, you know, especially during the pandemic. Um, it's been it's been a hustle and it's always a hustle no matter where you live as an artist. But specifically here, you know, like I knew so many people that lost a tremendous amount of work. I, I personally lost a lot of work. Um, so if say a mural comes my way and I can't do it, I would definitely be calling up my other friends and we all try to support each other. And I, I'm real lucky because I've had a lot of, um, friends that have, um, invested in me doing commission work and whatnot. So, but it is definitely, it's definitely a hustle here. We support each other well. So John, I've seen in the news recently where Chicago's put up a half a million dollars, uh, for endowments for public art displays. What does that process look like? Have you tried to get in on that process? And, and what are your thoughts on that? Well, I did apply. I did apply last year for some, some grant stuff. Um, and uh, it was great. You know, like it really taught me the process of um, the application and what I need to do and how I need to document my work um, better. Um, I didn't get picked up last year. I haven't applied this year for those grants, but that's definitely something I'm looking into. Um, uh, some of the things I, I got to do last year, I was chosen for um, the same for the city, the League of Chicago Theaters, where basically they were doing a, the park district kind of was doing this grant um, from different scenic designers, because I'm also a scenic designer for theater. Um, and we had like some of the, I mean, I was in a room with some of the best scenic designers in Chicago, and they ended up uh, uh, choosing another artist um, that was amazing. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's been fun. I haven't been chosen yet, but I know my time is coming. John, I see a mural that's in the works behind you. If you can, just kind of walk us through the process of creating for you. What does that process look like? Well, I know for me right now, um, the, the, the thing that I kind of focus on the most is I try to challenge myself. You know, I try to say to myself, I want to see something that I haven't um, seen done before. Um, right now, I've been doing a lot of like digital art where I've been doing kind of like basically pulling different images and throwing them together and then taking out stuff and then adding my own stuff and stripping it all down and doing all these different, you know, do these like different like kind of Photoshop programs. And um, the great thing about uh, the murals, at least that I'm working on digitally is I can show that to a client. Like, this is the way it's going to look. And then 
Um, we can digitally manipulate it if we want to change something, which was way better than it was in the past where I was constantly having to redraw something and it would take a lot more time consuming. And then like for this, for this mural, for example, I would use a projector to help with the shape of it, um, which saves me so much time. But for my own work, um, I think right now, personally, a lot of things that I've been um, kind of focused on is the kind of story of America and how we've um, uh, kind of, how we're kind of a violent country. And it kind of shows a lot of my work. I'm, I'm from Texas originally, and I've always had a big thing kind of for Westerns growing up as a kid and whatnot, and these kind of violent roots that our country has. And I've been kind of exploring that, we're doing paintings of all different types of people from Bonnie and Clyde to, um, you know, things that are happening like, you know, politically in this country right now. And, but just exploring that kind of art is fantastic because, you know, as a, when I first moved to Chicago, which January 3rd has been 20 years for me, I, I started out doing a lot of theater and I did a lot of collaborative artwork, you know. Um, I always thought being a painter would be like the old man dream, you know, but here we are. <laughs> and the pandemic really helped. And, uh, and now I'm like kind of exploring a lot of my country's roots, but also being kind of told through this very masculine kind of, that's why like, I have this whole series of like kind of flower cowboys where I use the silhouette of a cowboy, but then I find like really um, beautiful flowers, you know, like the juxtaposition of that, of, like this very tough kind of Texas cowboy, and then this beautiful orchid coming out of his chest. And so I've been kind of exploring those. So for me, that's one of the things that I'm most jealous of with anybody with a, a ability for art is the fact that you're able to look at the world and see it for what it is, but have the ability to recreate it and reimagine it in the way that you want it to be. And I think it's important. And I wanna thank you for sharing your art with us today and, and all the artwork that you do, because I think the world needs to be reminded that it is a beautiful place and it can be a beautiful place and it can be whatever you want to imagine and create. Um, it brings me to another question though. I know you also work with children and, and I'd like to know what it's like to try to foster that imagination and that creativity into a child. Art is such a vulnerable thing how do you how do you foster that in a child and instill that kind of confidence and allow them the freedom to create? That's a good question. I've been um, I've been teaching um, I've been teaching theater to kids because um, I'm also an actor as well um, for about 15 years. This company called Lifeline, and basically we go into a, a school and we teach teach the kids how to work together as an ensemble, and then um, playing theater games and really you know I always say like you know I'm teaching theater but really. Um, I'm teaching confidence, you know, because I, I, I kind of specialize in working in schools where English is a second language or kids with like special needs or at-risk youth. And so we use theater as like a great tool to like um, have them work together as a team. And then we take a story, um, whether it be a fable or a book that they're reading, and then we teach the kids how to adapt that, um, that story into a play and then they perform it for their peers. Um, I also have been uh, teaching art as well and after school programs in the last few years, which has also been extremely rewarding. But honestly, you know, with kids, you know, that creativity, you know, I steal a lot of their tricks. <laughs> <laughs> their creativity, you know, they're always inspiring me, you know. But, you know, with some kids, um, I think they just need that extra like push, you know, like when, when, I, when a child, like over the years, I've had many, many kids give me art and I'd save all of them. They're like my gold, you know, like my Bitcoin, you know, because it's like, to me, like, that's like the most precious thing. It's like when a kid makes a piece of art and like, look at this great thing I did, you know, I've always been um, a person and been around people that have always been like, look at that, that is the coolest thing, you know, I've been real supportive of that. It's a process of making it. And, you know, in, in, a, in a bigger sense, really art is, is another form of therapy. I applaud the fact that you take the time to work with the youth and the fact that you recognize um, and take inspiration from them. I think some of my favorite artists, one of the things that I enjoy about them the most is the fact that as an adult, they're still able to capture that childlike quality in their artwork and that exuberance and that imagination um, that only children can bring. What's That's your favorite what, medium that was Picasso's whole thing, you know? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it, took my, it took my whole life to learn how to draw like a child again, you know, so... Exactly. Um, and so when you're painting or when you're working, I, I know you, you've done scene design, you've done, you're, you're mentioning digital work. Um, what is your favorite medium to work with? Right now, my favorite medium is definitely acrylic paint. You know, like, um, 
I like it because it dries fast. I don't do, I don't norm, I don't do oil, oil paintings. I've actually never done an oil painting. I mean, my whole life, um, spending most of it in theater, you know, I'd usually be working with like latex paint, stuff that had to dry really fast. And so because of theater, I've learned how to mimic different styles of art. And um, acrylic right now is my favorite just because of the dry time. And um, uh, although I do think that eventually I would like to get into oil because the blending technique and the, the, the richness of the color is amazing. But, you know, it also depends on how you seal the acrylic. But as of now, that's my favorite acrylic on wood or canvas. So I know you're working on a commission piece and I think we can see it there behind you. This is for a virtual reality bar? It's called Redline VR and it's on the north side of Chicago. And if you're, if you're Chicago based, you have to come see it. It's, it's amazing. I mean, there, there's a bar and you, know, you get to you know, put on the whole VR headset. And you know, once I started doing the VR headset, um, that has been like a game changer. It's, it's incredible. And we're actually, um, Aaron Sawyer who runs Redline VR, he's actually even reached out to me to actually start to bring VR into classrooms, into schools. And so that's something else we might want to do for kids, which I'm sure will hopefully inspire a lot of children, especially kids that are interested in maybe gaming or um, uh, digital design. So speaking of the commission pieces that you're doing, as an artist, do you ever feel like you're inhibited when you're trying to confine to a client's vision or to try to match a client's vision? I know it's hard to see into other people's heads. How do you kind of work that out as an artist? You know, I my favorite kind of commission is when someone says, I got this great idea, John, for a painting. And it's about something personal to me. And then we talk back and forth. And um, those, kind of, those kind of paintings was amazing. There was this like, um, this playwright I knew that was um, um, her family um, comes from like, a, like a, an Indian family. And she grew up in Arizona and she was basically working on these plays that was going to like, a, like a 10 year cycle basically of all the plays talking about her family history. And so we had this incredible back and forth where we came up with this really cool idea concept. Those kind of commissions are great. The commissions that I really tend to kind of shy away from are the ones of like, paint my dead dog. <laughs> you know, like, you know, I'm trying to, <laughs> to kind of get away from those. But a commission where I get to work together with someone, because I've I, I love collaborative art as a theater, you know, artist, even though I'm kind of like, you know, I'm away from that, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like, I'm basically kind of tired of telling other people's stories. It was kind of time for me to tell my own. And so um, doing painting has been, been really healthy for me and, and you know, kept, my, kept, me, kept me busy and, and really there's a real big healing aspect to it. Um, but, you know, I, sometimes I'll, I will take on some silly commissions, you know. Um, I'm not too proud to do some, do some dead dogs every now and then, so. <laughs> Gotta get the bills paid, right? So John, let's just say the endowment grant did come through and Chicago handed you a blank check and told you to create anything you wanted to make the world a better place. What would that dream project look like for you? You know, um, I have this amazing girlfriend um, named uh, Alicia Gonzalez and she's actually a therapist and she's from the Dominican Republic. Um, and we've been talking about something uh, of me going there and maybe making doing some murals. And one of the things that I've really kind of want to combine the idea of, and this is something that obviously can be done there, could be done in Chicago, really could be done anywhere. And I've seen a couple of other artists um, do this, but she kind of helped me um, process this idea of going into a neighborhood and then finding the children of that neighborhood um, and then you know, taking photos of them, hearing their story, and then coming up with a really cool thing where we paint them like on the side of a house or side of a large building, like a huge mural of yourself as a child, maybe doing something fun, maybe playing within the friend or whatever. And I think that's a, that'd be a really interesting way to affect a child because they could be walking down the street and like, oh my God, that's me. You know, and when you see yourself on a big building like that, maybe, maybe they're just like, you know, um, doing a jump rope or they're um, on their bicycle or talking to a friend, whatever. But if, I, I love to do a, a art where, a child walks by that every single day and they're like, that's me. You know, I think that those kind of things and a really big, huge murals, like I'm talking really big. I think that would really affect not just that child, but maybe other children, you know, like kind of thinking about doing that some sort of, some sort of way of socially engaging people. So the mural tells the story of maybe that person. 
or, you know, or get weird with it, you know, like make them into like, what kind of superhero would you want to be and make them into that superhero, like what they would look like as that superhero. As long as you're going to be changing kids into superheroes, let me just tell you, man, I'm a 45 year old male child and I'm totally down with being transformed into a superhero. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> um, I mean, it's really, it's really endless, you know, and I, I know there's funding for that. Um, but I really think it's important that it's about the real people. Like, and that's the thing I, I've learned that whole concept even when I talked about, it, I really learned from Chicago because this is no offense to where you're at right now, but this is the best city in the world. And the people here are real. And that has made me a better artist by being inspired by them. And there's so many, I feel like there's some people I'm not talking about actually. But. So John, let us know, what's the best way for people to keep track of you and, uh, and to watch future projects and, and make sure that we're able to keep track of what you're up to in the future? You know, right now, Facebook and Instagram is kind of what I've been like showing my work, you know, it's been, it's been, it's been really good. It's like, I've been able to show a painting on Facebook and then a couple of days I sell it or maybe the day of, you know, I tried to have a website before, but it just wasn't doing anything for me. I just wasn't getting the, the hits and, you know, I'm spending all this money and then Instagram comes along and I mean, it was really kind of a game, game changer. Um, it's such a great platform for artists, you know, and, um, and, you know, and Facebook is too, you know, I try to keep Facebook kind of, uh, focused on the art and kind of PG 13, you know, um, right. but, um, but that has been, that's the, the easiest way to kind of reach out to me. My hashtag is like John Ross Wilson art. And then you'll see a lot of the things that I'm doing there. I mean, I, uh, because of the pandemic, I had a couple of really great things that I was going to be doing that got canceled. One of them that's being shelved is, um, I was going to be doing a large art installation at Burning Man, um, which I went to in 2018. And I'm part of the Burning Man community here in, in Chicago and, uh, extremely inspirational, like life-changing seeing art at that scale from people from all over the world. And I have a friend of mine named um, Ada um, Cashier who does these things called uh, Space Cats, where she basically makes these space cats that um, like, and like kind of like, they're like in the sixties mod kind of suits. And they're really cool. Like, like nice. little, they look like kind of Mars attacks cats, you know? And she did it over the years and they just granted us this like eight to $10,000 uh, grant from Burning Man, which was so generous of them where we're going to make a huge cat spaceship. And so, you know, like a, like two scale, like large, like 19 feet high by 26, six feet, you get up inside it, you know, the, the, the tongue comes out and it's like a, I think there's one of the pictures I sent you has this and you slide down the tongue, but it's like, you know, the cat fur. So it's not real good. Right. <laughs> but, uh, um, and it's, it's an effigy burn. And so people would like write down all the cats that had passed over the years. And at the end of Burning Man, we would burn it. Um, so that got shelved, but when we start Burning Man back up, which would be amazing if it was in 2021, um, then we'll be, uh, we'll be doing that on the desert. And that'll be, that's a big project I'm looking forward to. So John, you're talking a little bit about the pandemic and how it's had an effect on the art community. And I know over the last year, we've all lost out on live concerts, gallery openings. Um, but I'm kind of hoping that when we return to normal, that it's a new and improved normal and that we have a huge influx of art from all these people that have kind of discovered their own hidden talents due to necessity uh, and them discovering new hobbies during the lockdown. Yeah, we, we're, uh, we're definitely on the precipice of um, uh, a, a, a huge explosion of music and art, you know, like a second kind of renaissance almost, you know, like after all this is over and we can finally go and go to a concert and dance and, and, you know, go make some art um, in front of people. I mean, like that's gonna, I think we're gonna get, I think we're gonna, I think as a culture, we're gonna see like some amazing stuff come out. Like this is kind of like a gestation period, you know, that I'm sure a lot of artists have used. I mean, me personally, there's been times when I've found myself really um, making a lot of art and then other times, not so much, you know, I actually got coronavirus, um, me and my girlfriend did. And uh, that affected me, I was like, I had the, like the, the body aches and I was so, so tired. We were like sleeping so much. And, um, but luckily, um, I'm feeling much better now. No, so glad to hear that you and your girlfriend both came through it. Okay. Too many people did not have that kind of luck. And unfortunately, when it came to the coronavirus, and unfortunately, I think while there's going to be a big boom in art, I think a lot of that will come from, unfortunately, inspiration from traumatic events. A lot of great art comes from pain and from tough places. So there will be some wonderful tributes and some wonderful 
pieces created throughout this. Um, but I'm just looking forward to being able to go into gallery openings again and celebrate art with artists. You mentioned that a lot of your stuff is on Instagram and Facebook right now. And I think that it's an advantage because I used to be a gallery guy. I went to gallery openings and tried to find new artists that way as much as possible. But because that has changed and has been missing over the last year, I've turned to Facebook and Instagram to try to find new artists. And I think I actually like it a little bit better because I feel like there's more of a personal connection with the artists themselves and I'm able to learn a little bit more about them. And it makes me feel like I'm buying into the person, not just the art piece, not just because I like the art and what they created, but because I've come to like them as a person as well. And I think for a lot of artists, that's going to be a huge advantage and is going to change the way people buy art uh, across the board. For example, I've, I've got a piece of yours from years ago when I visited Chicago with a friend and we ended up at your house and I'm looking around at all this incredible art and I finally just broke down and said, okay, what do I have to do to take one of these home? I like buying from people that I have a personal connection with because it means so much more to me. If I smiled at the piece to begin with, smiling at that piece and having the memories of the connection of the person and the conversations that we were able to have makes it that much stronger. And I think platforms like Facebook and Instagram gives you an opportunity to contact or to connect with potential buyers that um, you don't have any other way. And I, I hope it opens the doors for a lot of artists going forward. Yeah, and you know, you actually got, I mean, you literally were one of the first people to buy a painting from me. I mean, I really only started this process about five years ago. I mean, I, I had a friend of mine in New Orleans um, named Aaron Riker, uh, who was a carpenter with me in Chicago. And then I saw his art in New Orleans and it is unbelievable. Aaron Riker, please look, look him up. Um, and uh, he does these black and white acrylic paintings of uh, famous people and they're breathtaking. And I was just like, oh my God, you know, when we started talking about how much he was making and I was like, wait, you're making how much? Okay. <laughs> All, right. All right, this is, this is, this is something I don't want to do. And, and he was a huge inspiration to me. And I'd go, I'd go, I go to New Orleans every year and, I'd always meet with him and I'd be like, okay, tell me, tell me this stuff. Like, what do I need to know? You know? And so, um, but yeah, that, that, the painting that you have is like literally one of the first paintings I, I did, um, which is great. You know, when I look back on that work, you know, I, I look at it fondly, but I also look at it, you know, cause you know, no painting is ever finished. Right. You never, I never, I've never finished painting in my life. It's, it's always like eventually you're okay. I got to give up on this bad boy. I got to stop, you know, <laughs> you know, well, I mean, but was it, um, uh, some some painters will go back and and continue to work on their just stuff. You know, you just you're always changing. But um, but yeah, that I love seeing that piece. It's a fun one. It, honestly, I feel like the piece was made for me because I've been a geek my whole life. I'm a vintage toy collector. And this piece, I mean, not only is it a vintage toy, not only did I get an amazing painting, but you even had the toys that inspired the painting to go with it. And I got to take that home as well, as long as, as well as the memory of our conversations and the whole weekend. Uh, so, you know, it's just an incredible piece for me because of the memories involved, the stories involved, the toys that are there and the incredible piece itself. And I've gotten the opportunity to watch you over the years and how your style has changed and how you've progressed. And I can't wait to see what happens in the future with you and to keep track of all of your progress. So let me ask this, as Killer Cuisine, I'm obviously kind of a food-based platform most of the time. I'm, all, I'm into nourishing the mind, body, and the soul. Um, but if you were able to sit down for one meal with any artist, past, present, and what, who would it be with, where would you be, and what would you be eating? You know, so um, it, it'd be my grandmother. So I had a, I had a grandmother and that's where I, the only other person in my family that's an artist. And we never got a chance to really talk about that or explore that. She, toward the end of her life, she um, had a lot of mental illness problems and she died of Parkinson's. And, um, but when I started to paint more, my mom was telling me that, um, that she was actually an artist. And so I found some of her paintings and heard some of the stories, but we, we, we never had that moment where the two of us could sit and talk about that and so that's who I choose because I don't want to know like like where that comes from and also who inspired her you know where did she get it from and so like kind of know that family history that would be that's probably a big regret of mine too that I get that conversation so 
I would love to. I take her to, she never, she always wanted to go to New York. I take her to New York and I find the fanciest restaurant in New York, like the most expensive restaurant in New York. And I take her there and we'd eat steaks and we tip really well. <laughs> I love like really good tippers, you know. Yeah, I love that. I love that. John, I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. We can't wait to see what you bring in the future. And I just appreciate you joining us today and giving us some time. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time. No problem. So here's the deal, guys. I want to talk to more interesting and fascinating people, but I need you to introduce me. So if you've got somebody that's doing something incredible that I should be having a drink or sharing a meal with, drop me a line and let me know so I can get to talk to them. Love.